Welcome everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Palmer. I'm the Director of Conservation Programs at the Yellowstone to Yukon Conservation Initiative, also known as Y2Y. Um, the Yellowstone to Yukon region encompasses at least uh, 75 Indigenous traditional territories. Um, and I'm speaking to you from Calgary, Alberta, which is located on the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, um, which includes the Siksika, the Kainai, the Pekani, as well as, as the Tsitsina Nation, uh, the Stony Nakoda Nation, and um, the Métis uh, Region 3. So welcome. And as I mentioned, as people were joining, you know, it would be great if you could, I think a lot of people are doing that, if you could put your you know, your name and where you're, you're joining us from, that would be wonderful. So anyway, I'm just, um, I'm really thrilled that we've got so many joining us uh, today on this webinar. I think this is gonna be a super informative session and also one that is super impactful. Um, we've got, we had well over, um, I think about 200 registrants or so. We've got an amazing uh, group of panelists um, who will share their knowledge and expertise on roads and wildlife in the transborder uh, region of Yellowstone to Yukon. So again, just so thrilled you could all, all join us. And I also want to say, I think this is an incredibly opportune time. Um, in the U.S., as I'm sure many of you all know, the U.S. just pa passed uh, the uh, bill, the infrastructure bill, which we've been waiting for, which includes a line item for $350 million for wildlife. Uh, infrastructure. This is incredible. This is super exciting. Um, in BC, um, I'm just going to show you, this is very old school, but <laughs> uh, this is the cover of this month's Canadian Geographic, which features a story on how the latest wildlife crossings are saving bears and other species. Um, this story focuses on Highway 3. Highway 3 is one of the uh, four roads that we're going to be talking about today. And we've got some folks here uh, joining us who can speak very directly, um, very directly involved with, with Highway 3. So that's coming up a little bit more on that today as well. And then in Alberta, um, just last, last week, the government uh, put out for tender a new crossing that will happen on Highway 1, um, just between, um, between Calgary, well, actually it's around, just before Canmore, sort of around Lac des Arc, area, if some of you are familiar with that region. Um, so that is really exciting and it's set, to, construction is set to be completed uh, September of 2023. So um, you're gonna hear a lot more about um, other structures that have happened on Highway 1. Um, and uh, anyway, so really exciting lots happening right now. And at the same time, why do I did some polling at the end of uh, October? And in that polling, we found that um, Albertans, 82% of Albertans um, support building wildlife infrastructure projects in these key areas. In BC, it was 84%. So people are interested and want to see this, this kind of work happen. So really an exciting time to be involved, an exciting time to have this, this uh, seminar. And, you know, I think there's just so many of us here today working on um, addressing this issue of you know, roads really um, d divide habitat and how do we, how do we not, you know, how do we address that? And also safety issues. So there's so many of us here today who have so much expertise working um, in this region um, and including indigenous communities, conservation organizations, uh, the United States and Canada, both of which right now are really prioritizing, um, you know, uh, supporting, transportation infrastructure that is really key, um, that's safe and effective for both people and wildlife. And both you, the US and Canada are also really focusing on conserving nature that, that um, you know, that through policies that address climate change and biodiversity loss. So this is all part of that bigger picture um, as well. So I think the alignment that we, we see across border is really exciting. And um, this webinar is really looking at exploring uh, different perspectives and approaches. There's been a lot of work done in this area already. So what have we learned and where should we go from here during this exciting, uh, during this exciting time? So how can we scale up this work? Um, as I think you all know from the invitations, there's three panels. Um, so each 
The first will um, provide indigenous perspectives, the second uh, perspectives from agencies at the federal, provincial, and state level, and the uh, third will, will offer perspectives from science. So with that, um, I'm really excited, as I keep saying, <laughs> um, there will be an opportunity for Q&A at the end of each um, panel. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Jody. Uh, Jody is uh, WaterWise president and chief scientist. I'm sure many of you know, know her. She's going to give a little introduction on Y2Y, and then we'll start, start from there. Over to you, Jody. Thank you. So my job is to just emphasize and put context about why we're focusing on this transboundary region. So let's get going here. Sarah already said this, but the Yellowstone to Yukon region is literally overlaying at least 74 traditional territories of indigenous peoples. And, and the reason that we ask you to acknowledge where you are sitting and to acknowledge these traditional territories is to bring awareness and remember the rights of indigenous people um, and that they were the original keepers of this land. So the Rockies, I think Paul Paquette says it really well. This place is arguably the most intact mountain region of this scale of 2000, over 2000 miles long anywhere in the world. And the reality is even before COVID, we were starting to, to lose this. Now we're seeing people moving here in droves, recreating in droves. And if we wanna keep this place, this with all of its different wildlife species, we've got to take action to manage it well. So I want to tell you a little story about Pluey the wolf. Pluey was a wolf that was uh, collared actually just south of Banff National Park. And she's kind of an amazing wolf because it was at the beginning of GPS collaring. Um, and what we found that the scientists found is that she made this 100,000 square kilometer jaunt. She went across two provinces, three states, 30 different jurisdictions, private lands, indigenous reserves, indigenous reservations, different public lands. And ultimately she and her pups were legally harvested south of Kootenai National Park. So what did she tell us? This was early on in Y2Y. And what she told us is that protected areas are really important, but they're insufficient. And so if we wanna do conservation for wide, wide ranging critters, what or wolves or elk, we actually have to think at a large landscape scale. And so um, her movements along with other movements like mountain lions that moved from Missoula all the way up past Jasper National Park and other animals really inspired the Y to Y vision. So our mission is about connecting and protecting the habitat all the way down from Wyoming, all the way to the Arctic Circle in the Yukon so that both people and nature can thrive. The approach that Y2Y takes is using science and knowledge to tell us where and what needs to be done to solve critical conservation issues. We work at multiple scales. So ultimately the lo most local scale of a community, but we also work all the way up to the global scale to support enabling policies that can help us get our work done in sight. And then finally, everything we do is in collaboration. We're really proud that we've worked with 460 partners in the last 28-ish years, and that's how we get our work done. So a lot of people have said, oh, why do I is an audacious vision, but does it actually do anything? And so we went, we set out to measure what we have done in the first 25 years. And one of those measures is just have we increased protected areas? And in fact, the answer is yes. There's been an 80% increase in protected areas. So the light green are protected areas that existed in 1993 when the Y2Y vision came to be. And these green, darker green areas are those uh, new additions to protected areas. What I think is particularly cool is that there's three new large indigenous led uh, protected areas that uh, amount to somewhere around 14 million new acres that are committed that are not yet even on this map. That's inspiring. 
So protected areas are important, but like we said, it's the, the, the connectivity in between them that make them effective over the long term and act like a network. So there's a few things that we have to do to do that. One of them is around private lands. So um, our organization has contributed and supported 490,000 acres of private land conservation and easements and, and acquisitions. There are other entities that are working even beyond that scope. Uh, the picture shown here is an example of the kind of private lands that we focus on, getting wildlife across public or private land valleys to get between core public land habitat. But also, it's really important to get private lands along roads in case that there is an opportunity to build underpasses or overpasses. So they're part of the roads conversation of today. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. In the YWI region, there are already well over 100 wildlife crossing structures in the region with associated fencing that are dedicated for wildlife to get safely across roads. And we know that they significantly reduce collisions, keeping both people and wildlife safe. And that's the subject of today. This is a somewhat geeky uh, spreadsheet, but I wanted you to see this. So a lot of fencing, about 138 kilometers of fencing, 10 overpasses and 107 underpasses. Are we done yet? No, there are a lot of roads that are increasingly busy uh, that are either completely a barrier for wildlife or a death knell for many wildlife species. So today we're going to talk about Highway 1 or the Trans-Canada Highway. There's been amazing work done in the parks of, in, on, along Highway 1, which um, Highway 1 divides several national parks. And now we've just heard and we're going to hear more about a new overpass for the first time in Alberta outside of a national park. Highway 3, both on the British Columbia and on the, um, the Alberta side, there's priorities that are being set and there are real needs there to continue to move forward. We're gonna hear about Highway 93. Part of that is in the Confederated Salish and Kootenai uh, uh, Reservation. Um, and the first phase of that represents one of the most progressive wildlife crossing structures in the United States. And I should say that in, ba uh, in Banff National Park up on Highway 1, that's the most progressive wildlife crossing structure in Canada. And then there's I-90. We've had examples um, uh, of where a motorcyclist hit an elk just east of Missoula, and there's a real need to mitigate that. Can we mitigate that in a way where we can maintain the flow of wildlife across that highway? Right here is an open span bridge just west of Missoula. Uh, we worked with Vital Ground to purchase this property um, on this side in order to keep the possibility open for wildlife. But this section of, of highway where we've seen elk killed and other critters killed um, is yet to be fenced. Um, and there's also an open causeway just to the picture's right. Um, what would that be west in the picture? Um, uh, that is another possibility with some simple fencing could be much safer for wildlife and for people. So I guess I want to just say that I'm really hopeful that by following science, um, that maybe together, everybody on this phone call from the panelists to the listeners, maybe we can work together to get four of these busiest highways in this transboundary region where we still have a relatively intact mountain system, safe for wildlife passage. And if we do that, we're supporting both countries' commitments to 30 by 30. So I will end there and um, we will move forward with this conference. Thank you very much for joining. Great, thanks so much, Jody. Um, we'll now... Um... I'll pass it over to Pat Smith, who's the moderator for our first panel, um, Roads and Indigenous People. Over to you, uh, Pat. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, I am Pat Smith. I'm chair of the US section of the Wide Wide Board. I'm honored to chair this panel. Looking forward to this webinar, uh, I am a retired recovering attorney 
Uh, I've been fortunate to live on the Flathead Reservation in the Jocko Valley on sort of the southern part of the reservation for the last 37 years. Uh, I practiced Indian law for 31 years, representing Indian tribes in the U.S., mostly Montana. Uh, and uh, I enjoyed 10 years as an in-house attorney for the Salish Kootenai tribes before I went into private practice in Missoula in 1994. Uh, my wife and I have been driving Highway 93 Wildlife Corridor for 37 years as part of our daily commute, both before and after the under, uh, underpasses and the one overpass was put in. It's one of the busiest highways in Montana. Uh, the old bumper sticker that people used to have on their cars was, pray for me, I drive Highway 93. Uh, we live near Ebro Hill on Highway 93, three miles from the wildlife overpass that uh, lies near the top of the pass. Based on my personal experience, driving Highway 93 wildlife crossing infrastructure is not only good for wildlife, it's very good for people who drive cars uh, like uh, my wife and I. Uh, I know numerous people who have hit a bear going Ebro Pass before the wildlife crossings were put in, including me. Uh, I had a black bear running full speed at night hit my driver's door, scared the hell out of me uh, while I was driving full speed. Uh, the bear survived. My wife and I were also lucky to escape with our lives on a particularly bad collision with a white-tailed deer on Ebro Hill, which crate came straight through the windshield at about 65 miles an hour uh, while, I was, while I was on full brakes, totally in the car. So we, we definitely appreciate uh, uh, the, these structures uh, for both wildlife uh, and, and people. The first panel uh, this morning is entitled uh, Roads and Indigenous People. Uh, and we have two panelists. Uh, the first is Whisper Camel Means, who's a tribal wildlife biologist with the Salish Kootenai tribes. Uh, unfortunately, Whisper is very sick. Uh, and so we uh, have decided uh, this morning that what we will do is uh, uh, we will play uh, a presentation, a recorded presentation that Whisper has done regarding uh, Highway 93 and her work on Highway 93. And we'll, we'll show that instead and wish her a quick recovery and thank her for all of her contributions on this effort. Uh, Dr. Jody Hilty uh, was Whisper's professors uh, while she's working on this project. So Jody is familiar with this project and Whisper's work on it. And so she will, Jody will assist us with the uh, uh, question and answer on that, uh, uh, albeit not, not, not from an in indigenous perspective. The second panelist uh, we'll have this morning is Jarrett Two Youngman, a Nakota storyteller and filmmaker. And Jared will introduce himself in more detail when we get to his presentation. Let me just mention that he is co-founder of the Nakota AV Club, which is dedicated to helping people tell their own stories through film animation and storytelling arts. He's an award-winning award -winning filmmaker, so very anxious and looking forward to his presentation. I should also mention that the Tanaha Nation has been a supportive partner uh, on the, the Highway 3 project, but was unable to, uh, due to other, other workloads, uh, participate in this panel, but just wanted to mention that they've been very engaged. My understanding is that uh, Jim Clarecoat's uh, Tanaha Citizen may be joining on, on the webinar today. Uh, I think he works with the Fisheries Department there, and so we welcome any, uh, any, any comments he may want to make on this uh, as well. So we will get started, which starts with the video uh, of Whisper, and we'll allow a few questions after each presentation, but there will be more questions at the end of, at the, end of the panel as well. So with that, uh, thank you, and uh, we'll hear from Whisper. And I'll just set this up to say um, what you're going to hear is the is the first 20 minutes of an amazing presentation she did at the Jackson Museum of Wildlife Art. Um, I'm really sorry she's not here today because she is a force of her own and I'm quite concerned about how sick she is. Um, there's a lot of COVID in Western Montana. I'm really hopeful that she's uh, not falling ill to that. Um, so 
Uh, I will, uh, after the first 20 minutes, I will come back and, and just summarize the rest of the story for you. Thanks, Brittany, for starting the film. Thank you so much, Jody. That is a great hype woman right there. If only I had that great introduction every time. Uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody. I'm going to share my screen and give you a PowerPoint and talk about um, our highway mitigation project that's happened on the Flathead Indian Reservation. I'm going to start by giving us a picture and kind of overview of the state of Montana and the tribes that reside within the state boundary. There are seven different reservations in the state of Montana. The Little Shell Chippewa just became federally recognized. I think last year they were trying to have their um, their big celebration amid COVID and, and it was really exciting for them to be recognized. Um, one of the things I did ask for the link to this OPI to be put in um, the chat because it is the Office of Public Instruction. Uh, Denise Juno is a really well known in the state of Montana native educator and when she was head of the Department of Education for the state, she really put in this big effort to get all this native information from the individual tribes onto the to the state so that they could send that information out to students in our schools to learn. And one of the great products of that was this map that shows territories of the different tribes. For us and why I wanted to show you this, the reservation we'll be talking about is here in Western Montana. I call it the little boot shaped reservation. But the thing I want to really quick call out is there's this little bit down here in the nose of the state of Montana, as I also call it, um, that was the conditional reservation of um, that was part of the treaty that was negotiated with our tribes. When our people were brought to our reservation, it was a, a mix of tribes in the region and we were pushed on to this one little bit of land. And the conditional reserve wasn't intended for our people to be a conditional reserve. We understood that to be the second part of the reservation, but when our treaty was ratified, that was removed. So we really have this physical disconnect in our area from where our, some of our people used to be, the bitter at Salish down here in the nose, um, and that everybody's up here on the reservation now. That's not to mean that there are tr tribal members that don't live on the reservation because people live all over the country. And so back to our boot of the Flathead Indian Reservation, the Confederated Salish, which is the bitter at Salish and the Kalispay, and the Kootenai, which was a band of Kasanka, um, all reserved this 1.3 million acres of our ancestral territory. So we were not given this land. This land is part of our ancestral territory. It was just the part that we held on to during our treaty. And the cool thing, I mean, our reservation is really very um, different in the different types of habitat types and landscape variables. In the west, south, and east, we have very high mountains. Um, we have a, the remnants of a glacier, which I think has been downgraded to an ice shield at this point, or an ice sheet at this point. Um, we really just have some cool landforms. We have the Flathead River that flows out of the Flathead Lake, which is the largest freshwater water body west of the Mississippi. Um, and it was also part of the historical Glacial Lake Missoula. I'm not gonna get into Glacial Lake Missoula, but if you have never um, heard of it, you should really check it out because it is an amazing story about ice dams and floods and just how water shaped all of the Western United States and really was part of this um, area. And we really have unique landforms. So this is the section, this is Kicking Horse Reservoir, the, the line through the middle, this is Highway 93, US Highway 93. This is the one we'll be talking about the most, some county roads off of it. Um, 
a lot of our reservoirs in the on the reservation are irrigation tied. So when you look at this pothole area that is all glacier results of the glacier that moved through here, this didn't used to be a big reservoir. It was just a continuation of those pothole areas. But this aerial view really gives you a cool look of um, some of the neat landforms. And again, the Mission Mountains. And right here on the edge is those remnants of that glacier. I'm going to take my little cursor right here and point out this little pond and then zoom in on it a little bit because I want you to realize these landforms and the things that are on the landscape here, roads in history have not been responsive to the landscape. There's this little barely remnant thing you can see here. This was the old highway before 1955 when this highway was put through. So previously, as you might expect, the road went around the big pond, but during the whole reconstruction era of building up highways in the United States, they must have had a lot of fill because they just filled in through the middle of this pond and built the highway right through it instead of around it. The interesting thing here is that all the years that I drove over this road, I just assumed there was some sort of culvert under there. You see water on both sides of the highway. It seems pretty level. You think that there was a connection. But when I started to work on this project and saw these aerial photos, there is no under highway connection at these sites. And most of the ponds that the highway cuts through along the, the, um, the route is similar to that. That's one of the old construction wrongs that will be corrected as time goes by and this highway gets reconstructed. But right now, any small mammals or waterfowl or shorebirds that want to go from one side to the other or turtles have to cross at grade or over the highway and many succumb to vehicle collisions. The highway also goes along a lot of different landforms. So this is a place called Ravalli Hill. Again, if you were a wildlife moving across the landscape, you might be walking up that corridor. You might be walking up a low area along the, the path or along the um, landscape where you would naturally travel and the highway in this instance also travels there. Also riparian areas. This is a small canyon. This is also Highway 93. This is the railroad track right alongside of it. This is the Jocko River. And as you can see right here, we didn't care about fill. We just filled in ponds and we filled in rivers and creeks and cut off oxbows, cut off natural um, meandering of, of waterways. And so that's another thing that we hope to see corrected in the future. <clears throat> One of the things that's interesting and I guess kind of set, sets our whole project apart from some other highway reconstruction or wildlife crossing structures and highway mitigations getting put into place is that all of this work occurred on an Indian reservation. And because we have treaty rights and because we are a domestic dependent nation, there are different ways that um, agencies have to deal with tribes. And so federally recognized tribes, which means we have a treaty with the federal government, we haven't been um, terminated for whatever reason because of those past um, federal actions, we are considered domestic dependent nations. And our sovereignty refers to our ability to govern ourselves the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes wrote our own constitution in the 1930s. Um, we define our own membership. We manage our tribal property. We regulate tribal business and other domestic relationships. And when it comes to negotiating, definitely between the state of Montana and the tribes, that has to be done on a government to government level. So the way I see it is that, um, in the state of Montana, the Mon state of Montana is not over the tribes like a county or a town would be. Those are an equal standing relationship. The federal government is over all of us and we negotiate with each other um, as equals. That is how we see it and we keep our, um, our power in that way. 
And so the, gov the federal government sees it that way too. The federal government also has a special trust responsibility to help us to protect our lands and our resources and provide services that we need. So as we're talking through this project, the federal agency that would have that federal trust responsibility would be the Federal Highway Administration. So they have to be here to intervene on behalf of the tribes. The 1855 Hellgate Treaty is the name of the treaty that we are currently and always will be under. It was negotiated by Isaac Stevens, who is the, um, the governor of the territory at that time. And in 1854, 1855, he was negotiating with tribes on the East Coast, or sorry, on the West Coast, and traveled into Montana just to the really, um, western section to negotiate with tribes by the end of that year and there's a specific article article three that relates to things that i do on a daily level and specifically to this project and one of those is that for the necessity of the public convenience roads may be run through the said reservation and the right-of-way with free access um, to all citizens um, in the United States to travel upon public highways. I've heard people say, well, if this is so important, why don't we just shut these highways down and make people drive other ways and put a toll at the end of the reservation and make people not drive through here. But part of our treaty specifically states that these roads are open to the public. They're open to the citizens of the United States. And so that's not an option. The second part of Article 3 also talks about the exclusive right of taking fish in all streams running through or bordering our reservation and the right to take fish in usual and accustomed places and together with the privilege of hunting, gathering roots and berries. This has been interpreted in more contemporary times to mean that our treaty secures our right to, to manage wildlife for the reservation. Through different federal actions, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes have been able to compact that type of program into the tribal government. So um, part of our program is funded by federal funds for wildlife and fisheries management. Other tribes in the state of Montana did not have um, a Stevens Treaty they have a different type of um, treaty that was negotiated in the years after 1855, and their language doesn't include this clause about the exclusive right of taking fish and um, securing hunting rights. So other tribes in the state of Montana do not have federally funded wildlife programs like we do. And our ability to have that program allows us to um, have tribal members with specialties, like hired tribal members with specialties in wildlife. And we were able to really keep an eye on the highway project as it came and be able to have input. And this highway was dubbed the People's Way. It is US Highway 93 North. And when MDT, which is the Montana Department of Transportation, um, came to the tribes and said, your highway is dangerous. You are a major artery between I-90 and Glacier National Park and Canada beyond. There are a lot of people traveling through here recreationally, as well as people that are daily commuters, people that are commuting between Kalispell and Missoula for work or the movement of goods or services. And so we need to upgrade this highway. There was a, a greater than normal amount of fatalities occurring on our highway for the type of highway it was. And they really said, you need to expand this road. But the tribes had a different view of it. We had different needs for our people to move around. We had different priorities and preferences to the four lane divided highway that the Department of Transportation initially proposed. <clears throat> It would have been fast, it would have been efficient, and honestly today there are sections of divided four-lane highway that are really fast and efficient, but they're not prudent for the whole entire stretch, the whole entire section of the reservation. 
We were worried about <clears throat> more people traveling through, more people driving fast and not like slowing down and respecting the land that they were traveling through. And they coined the term spirit of place. They wanted the highway, if it was going to be reconstructed, if it was going to be expanded, that we needed to think about roads in a different way than just concrete, asphalt, paint, fast movement, efficient travel, that we needed to think about the places that the highway was traveling through. <clears throat> of course, the Department of Transportation and FHWA, which is the Federal Highway Administration, really had to have their eye on human safety. That is where the money comes from for building highways. That is where priorities are put. But safety to the traveling public is what they value and what is important in that form. But we ex um, opposed an expansion to a four lane configuration and we really were worried about increased travel volumes and increased people moving to our area. <clears throat> So as we moved forward with this idea of spirit of place, we had different, so the federal government had to bring to the table some um, negotiators, people that would sit at the table, listen to both sides and help us all come to an agreement so that we could move forward with safety. We could move forward with making the highway responsive to the tribes. And it really borrowed from landscape ecology. So we are all landscape occupants, the people, the beings, the land, it's all part of that landscape. And we needed to keep that as the movement across the whole reservation. So the, the title was given that the road is a visitor and it should be respond to and be respectful of the spirit of place. Even though roads generally are permanent, as I showed in that little picture where the highway used to go around a pond, we know that they can change and they can make a really big um, impact. So um, it really was important to keep that in our minds. And so because we're thinking of the road as a visitor and we had these facilitated meetings between the different agencies and we were really pushing for this holistic approach of spirit of place, there were goals that were put on this highway that might be different than they would be if you were talking about a place that didn't have the ability, the political push to be able to try to negotiate these types of things onto a highway. And so we asked that the the team develop an understanding of the land and the relationship that the people here have with our land, that it's really important to us. It is the last remaining parts of our ancestral territory and we can't just go off the reservation necessarily and be in natural places. There's a lot of private land ownership. We wanted to find ways that the land could shape or influence the road, that instead of the paving right through the middle of a pond, maybe we do a little bit of meandering around and avoiding those areas. We needed to develop concepts that respect the integrity and character of people and places in wildlife. So important to restore habitat areas that had been fragmented by the road and the surrounding development. I have this little picture of uh, one of the kind of urban areas in, in the reservation and how the highway just split those trees and made that barrier so that wildlife, birds, whatever, have a harder time getting across this big section of area devoid of vegetation. <clears throat> but also respecting and restor restoring the way of life in small communities along the road. We have about five different communities that the highway travels through. And we wanted to slow the highway down in those areas. We have children living there. We have business owners that want to, um, you know, capture some people that are driving through. We don't want kids getting hit on the highway. So the, uh, the idea was to make those communities, design them to slow people down in a way with visually as well as the speed. 
So different colored um, concrete was put in some of them, different vegetation was planted along some of those routes, just to really make people think about the fact that they're driving through a town. And create a better visitor understanding of the place that the, our tribes call our homeland. One of the cool things that came about as part of this part of this project are place name signs. And as you travel northbound through the Flathead Reservation, all of the place name signs that you will see along the road are in the Salish language and they are Salish place names. And if you are on the north end of the reservation traveling southbound, so Kalispell to Missoula, all of the signs are in the Kootenai language and they are Kootenai place names for places along the reservation. Doesn't necessarily give the people traveling through um, how the set words are um, said. I feel like that's something that's missing because you see the sign and it's got this native language and you know that there's something there, but I wish that there was a way that people could hear it so that you could really get an understanding of what that word is and how that sounds and what that means to people. So back in 2000, we had all these negotiations, we had facilitated meetings, we came up with these holistic goals. And so the Department of Transportation, the Federal Highway and the tribes signed a memorandum of agreement. They say, we are committed to these ideals, we're committed to all these things we negotiated and, and um, agreed to. And so that's how we're gonna move forward. And there was really, that agency buy-in had to be there from the top down so that everybody understood this document is what is going to happen. This is the way we're going to interact with each other. This is the types of structures we're going to build. That's important and everybody needs to fall in line. So um, those plans included wildlife crossing structures, which Everybody traveled, not everybody, but a lot of the team traveled to Banff National Park to look at the cool stuff they were doing up there. They had already started putting in overpasses and underpasses, and that really was part of the, the template for what we put in here. Doesn't look exactly the same, but it definitely was the guiding um, place that we went to to say, see, these are working, see, these are put on interstates, we can do this. <clears throat> and we broke ground on the Jocko River Bridge in 2002. So there were negotiations and compromise. Okay, so what she did there was she set up what happened. And um, the um, if you wanna see the full video, uh, I believe it's in the chat, um, but maybe Brittany, you can repost it. But what I wanna tell you is that phase one got completed. So there are now over 40 wildlife crossing structures that are continuing to be monitored in that. Um, uh, on the Confederated Salish and Kootenai land. That's really great they really want phase two. In the phase two area that was identified but has yet to be built, uh, just in the last four years alone, I understand from, from the tribes that 10 grizzly bears have been killed on the phase two section of highway. They really want to move forward. There are some technical challenges of how you deal with the prairie pothole system. There's the need for money and there's the need for uh, a shared vision to move it forward. Um, and I would say, you know, it's my understanding also that, um, you know, the, the, the tribes recognize that, that wildlife are moving onto the reservation from various places, but also going to other places uh, beyond the reservation itself, still on traditional territory, and um, uh, including beyond I-90 to, to the south of the reservation, where we also need to think about uh, making sure that that busiest highway in Montana is safe for wildlife passage. Pat, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, I would just echo uh, what Jody's saying about phase two, especially that section of road from St. Ignatius to Ronan, as Whisper mentioned, she showed some pictures of that very sensitive ecological area. I used to commute that road every day for 10 years when I was in-house counsel for the tribes. 
Since then, the grizzly bears are, are moving out of the Mission Mountains, moving west, all the way to the Flathead River. So the amount of crossings now, as Jody mentioned, with those grizzly bear fatalities is, is, is just dangerous. <laughs> and there's it's just, you know, uh, just the need is, is, is there and it's growing even more for the reasons I just mentioned. That's one of the reasons that the bears are really moving now in, in the Flathead Valley and, and all over the place. So anyway, I'm very nervous every time I drive that stretch of the road, uh, especially anywhere near morning or evening because of that situation. So we'll allow for questions here uh, at the end of the end of the panel here, and I invite everyone to uh, submit uh, any questions you might have in the chat, and we'll deal with them at the end of the panel here. But I'd like to move ahead with our second panelist, uh, Jarrett Two Youngman. Uh, I briefly introduced him, but uh, I'd like him to uh, introduce himself a little bit more and uh, uh, turn it over to Jared. Hello, um, I'm Boss Ditz. Sukhnor Tanga Mani Mangyap Chano, Yiskahan Wa Aku Chano, Mish Wa Shijun Wa Ishino. So, my first language is Stony, and my second language is English. Sometimes my English is uh, pretty bad, and I will try um, what I could to explain anything that I actually know of um, what I do. And I'm from Morley, and we call it Minithni. And they actually call it Minithni and rewritten everything the words that how we pronounce things. That's very important to us, how we pronounce them. And it's very important to have uh, this connection with uh, what we do with the animals as well. And it's, it's incredible. And so I am the co-founder of Nakoda AV Club and I mentor uh, kids and how to make films, how to make animation. And we've been doing this for like a long time now, probably a decade now for me though. And it's really interesting how we learn um, a lot of things about how we move forward, who we are, because that's what we want to do. We want to actually educate the non-native people um, who we are, and they don't actually uh, know who we are. And so that's why we make films about us. And so that was uh, something that we do when we actually go into filming. And so I do a lot of film and I'm a little bit tired because I've been uh, editing a whole bunch of films uh, that from the bath and worked with other movie sets like uh, Predator and APTN. I work with them as well. And I work with the um, Imagine Native and so uh, I'm always busy, like I'm always doing something every day. And so I'll be quick as I can. And, but so I think I was supposed to be showing a film or um, this is where it's going. And so I guess we'll show the film. And after that, I can tell you more about that. Thank you. Those things run faster than you, Rabbit. Eee! How can we go across? Those things got Skunky killed when he tried to cross. Eee! Wolf, Bear, we have to do something about getting the others across. Or the protector animals. Do you have any ideas? <laughs> Wolf! What are you doing, man? I am making this. It's an atolatl. Those Eithgabi use this to throw their spears far when they hunt. Don't worry, Mr. Bunny. The wolf will catch you. I think you were doing that the hard way. Let me show you something. Yeah! Look! There's a path to cross the highway. Afternoon. 
Wildlife crossings like bridges and tunnels reduce collisions and make roads safer for everyone. Banff has been a world leader in animal crossings that reduce animals' deaths and car crashes. But the animals don't stop at the park boundaries. It's time to extend the benefits of wildlife crossing systems beyond the national parks. Yeah, so let me tell you a little bit more about that, how it went. And so AV Club like to actually collect stories. And then so we like to do that. And we like to actually um, show a little bit who, what we can do with the things about elder stories and animal stories and spiritual stories. And there's Northern Light stories. We have a whole bunch of them. And so Y2Y um, came to us and asked us if we can do a bridge about crossing animals. And that's when um, that was really new to us, something that we never done before. And so we all like, you know what, let's do it. Let's actually create something that that would actually meant a lot of people or that would actually make sense to who we are and what we want to do. And so it's like when we were actually uh, Y2Y took us to these bridges and under the bridges and Animal Crossing, it kind of makes sense to me that our people are actually equal as the animals because they're really connected and they're really actually going to uh, move how how stony move and then that's how animal move as well when i actually saw that um uh jolie was showing us that a, a wolf call collar track tracker was on his neck and then he went around like all the way so that's the thing we do too in long long time ago we actually do go around like oh all the way us and come back through until winter on a mini fni morley and that's where our campsite it's not our land it's not our home it's our base camp like that's where we camp every winter or in the valley or the uh um big horn and so that's one of the things that it really connects us all the time and so it made me realize that um when the highway was created it got more harder for us as like the animals as well like we have to get vehicles we have to get like license and all these things that we have to go through and and the animals actually have the same problem that oh we have hard time going through the highway because we're gonna get killed and so that was the thing too if no one actually have a vehicle and then people cross that highway and they get killed as well it's like connection there that we actually um we like about these animals and they like us as well i hope <laughs> and that's very important to us that's why i'm like you know what we can actually try to create something that with this animals um that will put in in big thought into make them uh we were always gonna we were gonna put in stony but instead of you know what we'll just have them english and then have student written uh subtitles and so tishina ear came in she's one of the members of the av club and then she came out the story and she written out a 
uh, storyboards and then uh, everything all was all set and then we were kind of rotoscope rotoscoping is like you actually hand drawn on on the board here and then you can actually uh, make that into your computer and then animate the whole thing like a cartoonist uh, in a way and but since the COVID happened we couldn't actually got together because it was hard for us to make this animation and so I'm like I suggest that we should do uh, uh, cutouts papers and construction papers and so that's when everything just start coming in and then I start doing all this cutouts papers and everything and then we actually communicate on on a computer and phone and then and the kids actually recording themselves on their phone and they sent it to me and then all the voice was on there and it gotten really uh stressed out a little bit but it worked out i'm glad it did and that is something that we would like to share all the time because we always struggle in a way that we try to work things out but it does work at the end and that's one of the most important things and when why to why share us about the animal crossing i never thought how important it was. I never thought of that before, that having the bridge and having the animal um, making a way for them. And I thought that was really something that should be more talked about more often. And so we never heard of that before until Y2Y came to us. And so, and that's why it, he, they helped us uh, understand more about the the environment and the highways and the animal crossing and then we are still doing continuing try to help each other out and so that's why it makes it so simple for us to actually understand the what's more important the animals and and the native cultural stories as well and that's why i think I, we got involved into and helping and why to why and yeah, and I think that's all I have in the story that we did. And, and they really appreciate, the kids are really appreciate what they saw and what they actually hear about. And Adam, Adam, um, the one who actually introduced us about uh, the bridges, uh, he's a really great guy. And uh, I think it was Tom. <laughs> uh, that he actually really did good job showing us the places and then we went to this one place that were animals always like I uh, get killed in one spot that um it was probably near almost outside of Morley <clears throat> uh in between the exhaust somewhere in highway 1a uh, 1a I mean highway um um wow <laughs> uh trans canada and that one place they always get hit on that one area they took us there and then they took us to saw us bones and animal bones and i thought that was like really uh something they should be aware of because that's only one place that animals always cross and so um Adam just messaged me. There's uh they actually building a bridge there and over cross there in 2023, September 30th. And I'm like, yo, that's great. I think that's great. I think that might be something very important that we did. And I thought that was really great. And yeah. Um, I think that's all I have to say now. Well, thank you, Jared. Uh Thank you for being here. Thank you for this presentation. You are a really good filmmaker and a very good storyteller. I, I still struggle with English as the first language, so I'm, I'm envious <laughs> of you. Uh, uh, I invite any other questions people may have uh, on Jared, but I would be curious also looking at kind of your film resume here, What? What are you turning your attention to now or in the future here with some video stuff? Um, wow. <laughs> um, there's, I got some calls. Um, they want me um, 
they want me to make a feature length of a horror movie. I love horror movies. <laughs> <laughs> in vancouver hopefully that would turn out good next year and i am writing a script about um powwow singers and it has to be more like uh who we are like reservations like the reservation dogs was a really presented who we are today and that's just was perfect it's like the more movies that we actually are nobody talks about who we are today and there's more documentary films will be coming out next year with buffalo um we're actually doing a buffalo uh, documentary as well it's a uh, feature links and we're going to be going to yaha tenda uh to travel to go find some buffaloes where um bath um um bath parks actually released a buffalo for uh, for the first time and yeah that's we're going to be working a whole bunch of films like next year still going on still working still tired but we still continue what we love doing and yeah that's that's gonna be our next chapter next year and we're looking forward to it and i hope it works out like and we won't be tired as much we, we want to sleep more but sometimes we do sometimes we don't <laughs> Thank you. That sounds that sounds great, Jared. I am particularly interested in that Buffalo stuff you'll be you'll be working on. And speaking of horror movies, when you got a white-tailed deer coming through the windshield at about 70 miles an hour, it's a lot like a horror movie <laughs> <laughs> up there on Everill Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, so I invite others uh, for questions uh, for Jared, but we did have a couple. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, I think there's a couple of questions in the, yes. the Q&A. Yep. I'll get to those. They came in on the first presentation. Uh, and one was, who does the monitoring of the structures and how is it monitored? So, um, yeah, the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Wildlife Department that's headed by Whisper does the, the long-term monitoring. I think they're still also engaging some with the Western Transportation Institute on technical support, but uh, they, they have a couple of different approaches to their monitoring. One is the use of cameras to detect what's using different kinds of structures and how often. The second, and I don't know if they're still using it, but early on they were also using track beds. So they were using essentially sand and then tracking what went through that sand early on. Thanks, Jody. Another question that came in, uh, have, have, uh, have they explored partnerships with insurance companies to help finance wildlife crossings? That's a very good question. It is a good question. And it'd be interesting to hear, I think some of the other speakers might talk about the economics of this. That's something that has been explored um, and, um, and I think can continue to be nudged along. It's, uh, uh, it hasn't gone anywhere yet, um, and I'm not quite sure what those reasons are, but um, it seems like it's a national level issue and a national level discussion of insurance agencies. That's all the questions that I have so far. If anyone else has one, raise a hand or something. Uh, but we're pretty close to on schedule here. So. Uh, uh, I was going to ask on phase two <laughs> on Highway 93 <laughs> when, when we might be moving on that, but maybe that will come up later with some of the other panels and we can talk about that. But uh, 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 it's just been, uh, we got through phase one and it's just been the long wait for phase two down here on Highway 93. <laughs> I want to uh, thank uh, Jarrett uh, for, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate uh, his insights and his work on this. And it, it had a real, real great dimension to our discussions here. So thank you very much, Jarrett. And with that, I think we'll move on to the next panel. <laughs>